launch into uh, what we know as reverse Bible study, there were some questions emailed to me uh, from some members that I want to read to you that I think are real critical and a good jump off for us for Bible study on tonight. You're going to find that there's some real relevant questions that I want to answer that have been sent in. And I do this because it's very rare that you get to ask a question and get it answered. Uh, it's very, you can't raise your hand during the sermon. Um, you pray that the message was for you. Uh, but many of us have uh, walked through life and come up with some questions about scripture, some questions about church, some questions about doctrine. Uh, other people have shared something about their religious belief or how they do something and has left you wondering. And I believe that one of the best things we can do is be an educated congregation that's able to give solid biblical answers for the real questions that we deal with in life. Not simply sharing with people what we learned in church, but being able to address them when they, when they have a question that threatens our doctrine or our belief, that we're able to defend it, that we're able to explain why we believe what we believe. And so because of that, I like to do reverse Bible study every now and then. So I'm going to start with, I think it's about three or four questions that I want you to hear and understand why they're so critical, and then open the floor for the remaining time for any doctrinal church or relevant life issue questions that you may raise. Is that all right? Okay. <clears throat> I want to begin. Um, to me, this is probably one of the most often asked questions, at least in some way, shape, or form, and one that many of us are not prepared to answer. I want to read the question as it was sent in. Let me first qualify this question by saying that I am a Christian who believes fully and wholeheartedly in the Bible. That said, I must confess that I have had those doubtful questions that have crossed my mind. I think any person of faith has to at some point. But I've wrestled with the question, how can I trust the Bible? That it was not put together with some kind of socioeconomic, political sort of slant. As you know, the Bible is not one book written by one author. It is a collection of books and scrolls written by people inspired and compelled by God. The Holy Bible, as you know it today, is a compilation of 66 books, beginning with St. Jerome's Vulgate in 405 AD, which is incorrect. Just a note. My question is, who chose or selected those 66 books as opposed to other books and testaments? As a person who appreciates history, I know there were numerous councils of bishops and church leaders, Council of Trent, Council of Nicaea, that met to settle or agree on unifying Christian beliefs and interpretations. How do we know that the books chosen or selected or excluded and not selected were agreed upon for the biblical canon were not influenced by political, personal, or ulterior motives? Many of my atheist friends argue that religion can be used as a tool to control, condition, and program people. How can I, or what biblical ammunition is available for me to use to answer those sorts of questions or accusations? Thank you, God bless. Um, this, to me, is one of the most critical questions we face as Christians, because it's a question about the authority and authenticity of the Bible. Very quickly, why is it real critical that we as Christians, believers, be able to defend the authority and authenticity of Scripture? Why do you need to know how to answer that question that was just asked? Why do you need to know the answer? So we base our salvation off of, right? That 99.9% .9 of what we teach, preach, and proclaim, we read out of Scripture. You know, our doctrines develop out of Scripture. So what happens if you're unable to defend the authority and authenticity of Scripture? What happens? You can be tossed by every wind of doctrine, right? And all of what we believe comes crashing down. Think about this, that most of what we, of how we defend what we believe is by using the phrase, the Bible says. Okay. But what happens when you're engaging with someone to whom that means nothing? Because they don't have any belief in the authority or the authenticity of scripture. How many people have heard attacks against scripture by the argument that too many men 
Uh, it was politically based, books were left out, so we can't trust that it's authentic. How many people have ever heard an argument like that? If you ever deal with a devout Muslim, especially one from the Nation of Islam, their primary argument for the authenticity of the Quran versus scripture is that the Quran is supposedly written by one individual, and therefore it is more authentic to a true revelation of God as opposed to our scriptures, which are a combination of different writers, different writings, and some of which were left out. Okay? So this is a critical question for us to be able to defend as believers. Um, there are a couple of things that were said in the question that I need to address before uh, we get into some answers. Um, the comment about many atheists argue that religion can be used as a tool to control, condition, and program people. Yes, religion can. But remember, at its core, Christianity is not a religion. And I know that sounds really strange, but Christianity is not a religion. It's not supposed to be some organized controlling mechanism. Christianity is really an expression of individuals who have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Christianity at its heart is your personal walk with God and belief in Jesus Christ. Not what you're taught to believe, not what people press upon you, but how you interact at, with Christ as your savior every day. Therefore, Christianity doesn't mandate bowing to Mecca five times a day. Pure Christianity, at least um, in, in its most authentic form, is not made up of a bunch of rituals and routines that allow you to be saved. It's based off of a relationship. I am a Christian because I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again by the power of God on the third day, and based upon that belief and that confession of him, the Bible teaches me that I am saved. And that, that's the extent of it. Now, I work out my salvation with you. We gather together of necessity for the work that we must do. But Christianity is not a religion. It's not meant to control you. You are meant to be controlled by the Holy Spirit's discerning in your life what you ought to do at every crossroad, every decision, every move you make ought to be guided by your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not you doing something because some preacher told you to do it or some religion told you to do it or some church forced you to do it. Okay. Does everyone see the difference there? So Christianity is not a religion. If you ever hear that, argue that to the, to, to, the, to the teeth. Christianity is a relationship that I have with God through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We worship together in a communal context, but at the end of the day, this church has nothing to do with the fact that I'm saved. Okay? I'm saved because of what I believe in my heart, not because of where I go on Sunday morning. Right? Okay. Now... Um, for those who've been with us in Bible study for a while, you know that the question about the authority and authenticity and integrity of the Bible is really about the process of canonization. I give you big words so that you'll know the correct terminology, but also when you start talking about canonization, you're going to start shutting folk down because now, now you're pulling out, pulling out the big guns. You know, now, now you ain't just going to talk to me about my scripture like that. I'm going to have to hit you with some canonization, okay? Um, so um, canonization. The word canon literally means rule or set. And so the process of canonization for, for short term is really the process of how the Bible came to be shaped to be the one you have in your hand today. How do we go from various scriptures and books and scrolls to what we have today. Now, I'm going to tell you that we've done a 12-week Bible study on this, and I'm happy to review it again. I don't want to start at the basics. That will, I can't squeeze 12 weeks into a few moments. Um, but I will make some opening comments about how the Bible came to be. Um, that in most cases... Let me pause like this. There's a different process for the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? And I encourage you to Google it, to research it. You'll find that the way the Old Testament was shaped is much different than the way the New Testament was. And we know that there was some version of the Hebrew Bible in existence by the time we get to the New Testament because we find Jesus quoting from Old Testament books. Paul quotes from other scriptures in the Old Testament especially like in the book of Romans, Romans, and you'll find that there's a lot of scholarly work on how Paul and Jesus utilized 
uh, the Old Testament. So Jesus say, you've heard it said such and such. And he quotes scripture. He goes to Luke 4 and he quotes from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we know that those writings existed because Jesus knew of them. Paul knew of them. They were existing in the synagogues. These scrolls that the Hebrews wrote for their scriptures were existing in the synagogues and in the temple. And so we know the Old Testament, at least those scrolls existed. Now, it being a book is a whole different concept. They kept the scrolls and we combine them together in what we consider our Bible as a book, but they would just pull out the scroll of Isaiah or the scroll of Ezekiel or the laws of Moses, the Pentateuch, and they would read them, okay? Um, those laws of Moses, we know those exist even in the Old Testament. Josiah the king, while he's reforming the temple and cleaning out the temple, finds the Pentateuch as a scroll and reads through it and tells Israel, we got to make some changes. So the Bible develops over a long time history and period of time. The Old Testament, whatever form it was, we know that those scrolls are existing by the time we get to the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, this way things typically go. Um, there would be those who would take upon themselves to write what they felt. Okay, gosh, this, all right, let me, I'm backtrack. The gospel is different than the letters, right? The Gospels are attempts to record the life of Jesus Christ, okay? two of which are supposedly written by followers of Jesus Christ. Which, which two Gospels are named after disciples? Okay, there are four of them. Let, Matthew, is, is that a disciple? M Matthew, we agree on Matthew. Mark? No, Mark is not a disciple. Mark is a companion of Paul, but Mark is not a disciple. Luke? Nope. John? Very good. Matthew and John. Very good. All right. All right. <laughs> Hercules. 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 Um, um, okay. So um, Matthew and John are supposedly, but if you like to look at the opening of Luke, Luke tells you he wasn't a follower of Jesus, but as others had taken it on to write about Jesus, Luke also decides to write about Jesus, okay? So different writers. You need to know that here's the way the New Testament is really formed. Jesus comes, Jesus dies, ascends to heaven. The church is formed, which we read about in the book of Acts. From that church, Paul goes out into the world. Historically, Paul's letters are written before the Gospels, okay? Paul's letters precede the Gospels. So if we're tracking them, we think Paul's letters really began around the late 30s AD. But the first gospel, which is the gospel of Mark, we can date at around 60, B, 60 AD, right? So the first gospels really don't even begin to show up till 30 years after Jesus has already come and gone. Okay? Paul's letters are first. Now don't let the chronology in the Bible fool you. Just because Matthew is before 1 Corinthians doesn't mean that 1 Corinthians was written after Matthew, okay? All right, so... Paul's letters, so as Christianity grows, you've got Paul writing letters, you've got Peter writing letters, you've got Thomas writing letters, you've got other Christian leaders writing letters, you've got people writing the Gospels, and so all of these works exist. And the question is, how do we determine which ones are scripture? Which ones are gonna be included and used for the formation of Christianity? Because the very first thing you should do when you're debating with someone about the process of canonization is acknowledge that there are other writings that are not included in the Bible, okay? They're, they're, trust me, by the time I finish giving you the answer, the, the, the person who smiled when they said that, you just set them up, okay? You just set them up, because if they think they got you by you acknowledging that, that then you're ready. You, you're ready, you've been giving them body blows, here comes a knockout punch, all right? Um, so we acknowledge that there was a gospel of Peter that didn't make it. We acknowledge that there is a gospel of Thomas. We acknowledge that other writers wrote about Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that all that exists and is not in our 39 books of the New Testament or our 27 books of the Old. We, we acknowledge that. So here's what happens. The period of time, all these works are floating around, all these writings, and eventually there's a movement among church leaders to say we've got to solidify this. We've got to make decisions. We've got, uh, because we've got a church in Galatia 
reading from the Gospel of Thomas, but the church in Rome doesn't. And remember, the movement to establish the Catholic Church, the word Catholic means universal. There was an early movement within Christianity to say, hey, listen, we can't all be in different places saying different things, reading different things, and saying we're all Christian. Okay? We have to be universal. And so the development of the Catholic Church uh, was a desire, a desire by church leaders to put us all on the same page, not only in our doctrine, but also in our scriptures. So over a period of time, church leaders gathered together in what were called councils, um, church councils, and you can Google those. The most important and historic of which is called the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., and it is there that you get a gathering together of bishops, church scholars, I mean, scripture, uh, scholars of scripture, who gather together and begin talking about doctrine and scripture. Now, the question that was asked suggested that is there a political and economic, um, a biased slant as to how these men who gathered together chose scripture. I would simply say this. They're human, guided by the Holy Spirit, and the most religious of men on the face of the earth at that time. You put what you want into it. Okay? But you would not have found a more scholarly spirit. I mean, we're talking about people who read scripture all day and prayed as monks in a monastery, right? Or church leaders who all they did was sit with God, read scripture, and teach people. And these people with good hearts and good minds gathered together to begin praying over and discerning which books will be included in our Bible. That doesn't mean that they're not human. But at the same time, that doesn't naturally mean that they're biased and uh, that they are ungodly or that they have been paid off. These are not lobbyists, okay? Okay, you gotta use a DC term. These are not folk who are in it for the money, who are trying to buy off votes from congressmen and senators. Uh, these are people who are led of the Spirit of God who all they did, their only desire was to preserve and protect the entity of the church, universal throughout all the world. So much so that many of them would die for their beliefs. So you can't tell me someone who would die for the cause of Christ when they gather together in a room, all of a sudden they're not Christian and aren't led by the Spirit. Okay? So there's, there's the key, dealing with who these people are. And they begin talking about these scriptures. You need to know that they debated several issues over several centuries. Um, I'm talking about even up, till, um, even up till the 1600s, much debate. And different versions of the Bible were continuously produced. Some Bibles didn't have the book of Revelation. Some Bibles didn't have Hebrews. As a matter of fact, even today, if you go to a Roman Catholic church, their Bible's gonna mess you up. Because Roman Catholic Bible is different than your Bible. As a Protestant, you have 66. The Roman Catholics have this little middle section called the Apocrypha with books that you, you don't read. You don't read Maccabees and Tobith and Judith. You haven't had to read the 151st Psalm. You only, you only said there's 150, right? So there are different versions of the Bible that came out, okay? Uh, you'll read about it, the Martian version, the Jerome's Vulgate, a lot of different Bibles over a lot of different time. What you need to know is what criteria did they use to select what eventually becomes the 66 books that we have. So what, what criteria did they use? Okay. Um, I'm gonna put out about four or five so that you'll know how certain books were chosen and how certain books were excluded and why. One of the very first Criteria used to say, okay, this in, this out is apostolic authorship. Those who made decisions about scripture believed that the scriptures that were most authentic were the ones written by the actual apostles. Right? Now, why would, why would that have more weight than, why, why would a writing by an apostle have more weight than a writing by one of his disciples or students or followers or Joe Blow who got saved 30 years later and wants to write. In the back, my sister, why, why would you say the apostolic authorship is important? Hmm? 
First-hand account, closer. The apostles are closer to Jesus Christ. So remember, the further away you get from the eyewitnesses of Christ and time elapses, the less we trust it. It's kind of like if an event happens and you want to read about it in the newspaper that day uh, that after it happens, but as time passes, we don't trust the reporting of it, right? So the apostolic authorship. So those, they were supposedly written by Matthew. Those written by Peter. Those written by Paul. Um, have more authenticity, um, according to these scholars, because they're written by those who are closer to the actual manifestation and incarnation of Jesus Christ. So apostolic authorship granted authenticity. Um, universal liturgical use. Universal liturgical use. Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, if you look at the history of the church, when the church is first established, and please, please, when I use the term church, I need you to think more than just one local building where people gathered. I'm talking about across the Greco-Roman Empire at that time, okay? When the church was established and Christians would gather, they would gather on the first day of the week, not the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday. They would gather on the first day of the week in honor and in celebration of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Uh, so technically, one of the reasons we worship, not that the day matters, but one of the reasons that most Christian worship is on Sunday is because Sunday is the day Christ rose from the dead. So literally, this may blow your mind, literally in Christianity, every worship service is celebrating Easter. It celebrates the resurrection because it happens on the same day that Christ rose from the dead. Okay? So as Christians, we celebrate Easter every Sunday, technically. So they would gather and before they could receive communion, which they did weekly, scriptures were read to them. They would hear Paul's letter. So the church would gather together, and the bishop, the leader, the pastor of the church, would read one of Paul's letters. Paul's letters began to circulate. They didn't just stay in Corinth. Paul may have written a letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians copied it and gave a copy to the Galatians. The Galatians copied it and gave it to the church in Ephesus. And so these scriptures are now floating around through all the churches, and the leaders would get up and read them in front of the people before they would receive communion. That's what the sermon was. The first sermons were people literally reading the entire book of 1 Corinthians or the entire letter to the church in Galatia or the entire letter to the Romans, and then they would receive communion. And so when the fathers got together 300 years later, and this is still the common practice in the church, one of the criteria they looked at was whether or not these scriptures were used universally. So here's an example. So let's say, let's make up, let's say there was a gospel of Judas, okay? Probably just for, for sake, gospel of Judas. If the gospel of Judas was only read in one church, but 1 Corinthians is read in 12, these leaders decided that the ones that were used more universally had more authenticity. Does that make sense? So if your work was only limited to your church, but was not received by the other churches, then they said, then this can, we will not identify this as scripture. It may be holy, it may be good, but we don't identify it as that which has been transmitted by the hand of God. Everybody get that? Okay, good. Third criteria. Alignment with orthodoxy. Basically, we want to be certain that whatever is in this writing is in alignment with what we're teaching about Jesus Christ and about our walk with God. And so if there were writings that suggested that uh, Jesus is not Lord, those didn't have a good chance of making it in, right? So to be certain that whatever is included is in alignment with what the church is now considering to be its common doctrinal beliefs. So understand this, this may get deep. So when these councils met, they were also debating doctrine. They were debating issues about the Trinity. They were debating issues about when does Christ become Lord? 
witness or do we say that Jesus is God? So they're debating these things, and as they're coming up with answers for the church, they want to be certain that the scriptures that they say we will use are in alignment with the decisions they believe God has led them to. Does that make sense? So they're debating scripture and doctrine at the same time to be certain that they're in perfect alignment with each other. So that what we teach and we believe, we know comes out of scripture. So alignment with orthodoxy. And then the final one is internal consistency, meaning that the book didn't contradict itself, that the writings uh, or, the, or have this person wrote was not contradictory. So let me give an example. One of the reasons Paul's works are so widely accepted is because Paul's theology and doctrine never changes, right? The, the, the Paul who writes to Rome is the same Paul who writes to Galatia, and his theology is consistent. Paul is one of the premier and first systematic theologians in the Christian world who fully, who fully had his doctrine together, and so you don't find Paul writing in ways to Rome that were contradictory to what he said in Galatia that is different than what he said to first Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians. There's consistency among Paul. And so we looked for consistency in these writings. Um, as a result, um, we have landed in a place where I can tell you three things definitively about your Bible. Uh, regardless of how many people wrote it, regardless of what process was used. Um, and just so you know, anyone who wants to argue that the Bible is not authentic because there was this process of deciding is someone who doesn't acknowledge the authority of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is able. Matter of fact, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will grant us wisdom. The Holy Spirit is able to work upon human flesh and grant it wisdom to come up with a product that is pleasing to the Lord. How many people believe that about the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can do that? Right? The Holy Spirit can use human. You know how I know that? Because he uses you. And you about as messed up as you can be. That we're about as imperfect as we can be, but somehow, somehow God takes this struggling young preacher from the south side of Chicago to preach his word, and people get saved and enter an authentic relationship with the Lord every week in spite of the fact that I'm not a perfect vessel. And if God, if we believe that God can do it in our local church and the Holy Spirit can move in this congregation, why would the Holy Spirit all of a sudden be, not be able to guide 12 council who gathered together to make decisions about scripture. Okay. So there are three things I can tell you definitively about your Bible that I want you to be able to defend. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that your Bible is sufficient. Here's what I mean by that. The 66 books you have in your Bible are sufficient to lead you into a right relationship with God. There's nothing missing. There may be other materials out there that have some more details or say this and that, but there's nothing these works that people quote that aren't in the Bible contain that all of a sudden will give you enlightenment that your walk with God is insufficient. What you have in your Bible today is sufficient. Trust me, as one who's been through seminary and had to read these other works, we had to take time to ask ourselves, okay, did anything come from this writing that all of a sudden I now need more than anything in my walk with the Lord? And the answer is no. There is nothing excluded that is necessary. All that is necessary you have as by what the Lord presented to you in these 66 books. Okay? It is sufficient. It is infallible, meaning it cannot fail. There is no way for what you have in your 66 books to fail to lead you to the life God wants you to live and to your eternal home in heaven. There's no way the Bible won't lead you there. This is a can't miss recipe. You follow these directions, you will be what God wants you to be. 
It cannot fail. There's no way you can commit yourself to your 66 books and study and try to live it out as you believe God puts it on your heart and you wind up in heaven going, hey, I'm wind up in hell going, what happened? Okay. You know, like I, I thought I followed, followed it correctly. There's no way that can happen, right? You follow what God has given. The promise, the guarantee is that you will spend eternity with God. There's no way it can fail. And then finally, Your Bible is inerrant. Now let's just take one quick minute to um, talk about what we mean by inerrant. Because uh, inerrant by a technical definition, you know, means to be without error. And if you hold to that as a literal definition, folk are going to jack you up all the time because they're going to start pointing out contradictions in the Bible, right? And try to make you doubt the authority of the Bible because the Bible says this in one verse and says this in another. And... Um, it's crazy to me how people who are against the word of God or don't believe in the authority of the Bible can spend all that time studying scripture and miss it. Like if, you, if, you, if you're astute enough to show me how this verse is different than that verse, then I got issues with how you can read all of that and miss what God was trying to say to you, right? Okay. Um, what does it mean to be an errant? The Bible does not have any error in what it affirms. Not necessarily, I need another marker. Not necessarily what it reports. Okay. So here it is. There's a difference between what it affirms and what it reports. The Bible, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, is not held to the same scientific and journalistic criteria that we hold for the Washington Post. The writers were not trying to give you objective history. They were trying to affirm God's movement in history, but they cared not whether or not it was Josiah instead of Jerusalem, right? So the writers are human and are affirming truths about God while trying to report historical fact, but the Bible is not a history book. And you can't allow someone to hem you up in a debate and a discussion because they want to debate the historicity. They want to say, well, because we found dinosaur bones, the whole Bible is irrelevant, right? Okay. Mo uh, Moses wasn't an archaeologist. So when he writes Genesis 1, I'm not going to hold him to a standard that he wasn't trying to uphold. Moses wasn't trying to say seven 24-hour cycles. What Moses was affirming is that there's a God who is in control of the entire creation and everything that happens plays out by the providential plan of an omnipotent God, right? The, the Bible has no error in what it affirms. Secondly, the Bible has no error as long as you judge it in its own cultural setting. It has to be judged in the context of the culture of the people who wrote. God did not take Paul and lift Paul out of the Greco-Roman first century world to just give Paul universal truths that would apply to all places at all times without some context. Paul is a first century Jewish Roman citizen and he writes from that perspective. The same way God doesn't lift me out of my Afrocentricity as a preacher. Same way God doesn't delete my south sidedness. Okay. Am I being used by him? The Lord uses us as we are made and in the world in which we live. All right? No matter what revelation you get from God, it's not that God snatched you out of 2013 and used you as some neutral, objective figure that had no historicity to it. The greatness of God is that God uses us even in the limitations of our context. So, Paul will write about slavery because that's the world Paul lived in. Paul will be gender biased because that's the world Paul lived in. Okay. Moses has limitations of his understanding of history because that's the world Moses lived in. That's who Moses is. Okay. And we can't expect 
even if being used by God, to all of a sudden mean that that erases who we are in context. So you have to read the Bible in the context of the culture in which it was written, if you're going to judge it. It is also inerrant in the purpose for which it is written. Real quick, go to the end of the Gospel of John. I think it's like John 20. Go to John 20. You got John 20. Let's start in verse 30. John 20, verse 30, you with me? And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let's just talk about John, John's gospel for one minute. Here's what John blatantly tells you. There are many things Jesus did I didn't write about. This is not an autobiography. This is not a historical documentation of everything in the life of Jesus. If you're judging it as such, then you're, you're, you're not hearing what I'm telling you. I'm telling you I didn't write everything. Um, prime example, it never rains in the Gospel of John. Does that mean it never rained in Jerusalem? No, it rains. John just doesn't record it. So you can't judge me by a standard that I'm telling you I'm not trying to live up to. It's kind of like you getting evaluated on your job for something that ain't in your job description. Now, that's not fair. I'm not trying to do that. So I shouldn't be evaluated on what I'm not trying to do. John is not trying to be historically objective. He says, I'm not giving you everything. And then he says, what I did write, I write for one purpose that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So everything I wrote, I wrote with one objective, for you to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. If it didn't serve that purpose, I left it out. It's very important to know the purpose for which the Bible is written. The purpose is to get us to see how God interacts with us as humans. And so in the Bible, when it rains, and they do say it rains, it's not because of meteorological effects, it's because God wanted it to rain. When Israel loses to AI in the book of Judges, it's not because AI, uh, we understand them to have military superiority and their uh, craftsmanship of their iron making and steel producing was better than the Israelites. No, it's because God said, y'all messed up. Now, science will go back and talk about the weaponry of the enemy and how they were greater. But then how do you explain when Israel defeats enemies who are greater? And the only answer from the Bible is it's because of the Lord. So everything they write is about God. It's about understanding the Lord and how God is at work. So I'll give you another example. So these, these writers, Moses, has a very limited camera. He's only trying to capture what reveals God. So he talks about creation and the garden and Adam and Eve. And then all of a sudden you're messed up in chapter 5 when other folks show up. <laughs> right? Where they come from? How are you marrying? Wait, wait, wait. Who are you, who are you married? Because when Moses is writing about creation, he's not looking at everything. He's not trying to describe the rest of the world. He's trying to get to focus on how the Lord has worked. And when it becomes important to talk about the others is only as they interact with the people of the Lord. So to say that God creates Adam and Eve does not mean to suggest that God ain't doing anything else outside the Garden of Eden. Moses is just saying, this is all I'm looking at. I have tunnel vision, and I broaden it as it becomes necessary for you to understand about the Lord. Does that make sense? Okay. Don't judge the Bible by a standard it, it's not meant to uphold. Um, but what the Bible is, is sufficient. So yep, there's some other books out there but I'm not missing anything. It's infallible. This way will always work. It will always lead me to where God wants me to be. Therefore, I trust in it, and it's inerrant. 
It is without error in the ways in what it affirms, if you read it in context, and if you understand the purpose of the Bible. Okay. Everybody get that? Let me pause for any questions on canonization, because now, now you're ready, you ready to get some folk. You're ready to get them told on the Bible, right? Any questions on canonization? Um, that took a lot longer than I thought. Um, can I read the second question that comes right alongside of it? Dear Pastor Wesley, I know you did a series a while back called Why I'm Baptist. Unfortunately, I didn't catch all of it, although what I did catch was extremely informative and enlightening. Thank you. My question is, if God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, why are there so many denominations in the church? It seems for us to be one body of Christ. There sure are a lot of fractures and divisions. I know a lot of it can be traced back to Peter and Paul, debate controversy, and even later to the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther. But I am curious, with all we know today, why are there still so many different do doctrinal interpretations and beliefs that translate to different traditions, customs, practices that define the denominations we have today? Is it biblical? If so, how do you know which is the right one or is in line with the word of God? If God is not the author of confusion and we are his church, why am I so confused on this issue? <laughs> Thank you and God bless. Um, well... Why are there so many denominations in Christianity? Understand that the concept of denominations really did not formally evolve until after the Reformation, uh, when there's a break from the Catholic Church to find what we know as the Protestant Church. Now, granted, there are different factions and beliefs and movements within the Roman Catholic Church, you know, from the Jesuit traditions to uh, the different Orthodox to Greek Orthodoxy, there definitely were different thoughts within the Catholic Church, but they were all maintained under one entity. It is in the midst of the Protestant Reformation uh, that we begin to develop what we know as denominations today. And so that doesn't really begin until the 1600s, all right? If you're looking for a time stamp, somewhere around 1595 with the Reformation do we get into um, these creations of denominations. Most denominations... Um, if you look at what splits them, and you'll understand why there are so many different ones, and I'm going to narrow it down. Um, okay. Some of the, most of them are divided around doctrinal issues, um, things that are believed and taught. And the doctrines can really vary on, on a few different things. Um, okay. One would be an interpretation of scripture itself. Uh, and let me suggest that it's almost impossible to believe that you and I as different individuals will always interpret the same passage the same way. We'll always have different interpretations. And that's guided by the Holy Spirit because where you are is not necessarily where I am. And so how God uses that scripture to speak to you is much different than how God may use that scripture to speak to me. So those differing interpretations is really the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'll give you an example. When I stand in the pulpit to preach, I'm pretty much certain I know what I'm trying to say, right? It may not always get out, but I'm pretty much sure I know what I'm trying to convey to you. And it's amazing to me how people can send me emails to talk to me after church and tell me what they got. And what I'm saying is, but that wasn't at all what I was trying to say. <laughs> I don't know how you got that, but praise be to God if you talk to you, you know. Um, just totally different interpretations. We had an exercise in seminary once. There were 13 of us in our preaching class. And the teacher gave us one text, and we all had to write a sermon on it, and you had 13 different sermons, 13 different. The different interpretations of Scripture, because so, most of what we teach and believe is based upon how we interpret Scripture, okay? Not only the interpretation of Scripture, but the use of Scripture. How critical is Scripture towards what you teach and believe? Um, in the Methodist tradition, scripture is but one part. We use reason, we use tradition, we use the teachings of the church. 
Um, all those are on equal, on equal standing. In the Baptist church, one of the reasons I'm Baptist, having explored other denominations, because in the Baptist church, the authority of scripture is the supreme governing guidance of all that we teach and believe. It's not what you think, it's not how you feel. It's what the word of God says. So you can tell me what the Holy Spirit said to you, but if that's in contradiction to scripture, I don't have to receive it and it doesn't have to be governing in what we teach. So one of the reasons I claim Baptist as my way of worshiping God is because I have a view that the Bible is critical for my walk with the Lord. Whereas in some denominations, it's not simply the Bible, it's what we discern in our prayer life. It's what has been passed on through the traditions of the church. So a lot of what you see in Catholicism may not have a biblical background, but Catholics believe it because they put weight into what the church tells them they ought to do and what they ought to believe. Whereas me, I go, well, I don't care what you say, if it ain't in the Bible, I ain't with it. Okay? That's me. Okay? But there are others who want that kind of authoritative. Tell me what I should believe. Tell me what I should think about abortion because it's not in the Bible. Tell me what I should think about birth control because it's not in the Bible. And you need someone to tell you. Some of us work better in disciplined, regimented worlds where there's a pure, clear chain of command and you're told what to do, you don't question it. Some of us, like me, are a little indignant. We like to question and search for ourselves and rebel and come to our own answer. Okay? So the use of scripture, and even with the use of scripture, there's so many different ways in how we use it from those who are very conservative and literal, that if God said this, this is exactly what it is, to us who say, no, that was metaphorical, that was suggestive, that was trying to give a universal principle, so we read the Bible differently. Okay? There's some people who read the book of Leviticus, and they will get messed up for the rest of their life because they believe they got to go to Jordan and wash seven times every time this happens, you know, because that's literal. And then some of us go, okay, I get the gist of what the Lord was saying, you know uh, so we've got our, um, how scripture plays in, um, our doctrine. Um, you may, our emphasis in our saying of the Trinity plays into our different denominations. Okay. Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Danny, in Catholicism, which part of the Trinity is emphasized the most? God the Father, God the Father. In mainline Protestantism, where you are, which, which part of the Trinity is emphasized the most? Jesus, Son of God. We're going to preach about Jesus every Sunday. Okay. You all know old school Baptist sermon. No matter what the sermon was about, you know where it was going to end. <laughs> right, 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 you know? You can, preach about Mo, you can preach about Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain to be sacrificed, and a good preacher, and I see another mountain <laughs> where a son was being led up to die. <laughs> you know, We're we going to get to Jesus, right? Okay. Now, in Pentecostalism, what part of the Trinity is emphasized? Holy Spirit, right? God, 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 you got Jesus, you got the Father. Uh, are, are you filled with the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues? Do you have the gifts of the Spirit? And, and those, believe it or not, this plays directly into worship preference. How you like to worship plays directly into it. I'll give you an example. Pentecostals don't have our power. Mm-mm. Because mm -mm. we tarry. Part of Pentecost, part of the Holy Spirit demands you tarry until he come. And we will tarry until he comes. There's a reason Catholic churches get out in under 60 minutes. <laughs> we ain't got to tarry. <laughs> we, should, you know, you know, we go through this liturgy. And some of worship preference is dictated by personality which you can't take away from. We have different personalities. And that sometimes shapes how we prefer to worship, and how we prefer to worship gets into our doctrine. Right? If you're a corporate mover and shaker and time is important to you, you like, okay? Within this whole church, there, there are different, different opinions. There's some of you all who can't stand September because that means our power is over. 
<laughs> and we like July and August, Pastor, that's fine. And then I have members who can't stand our power. Right? That, that isn't spirited enough. We shouldn't be rushed through service. Um, some people need charismatic. You're, you're, that's the way you worship God. You want to stand. You want to lift up hands. You want to be vocal. And then you go to some denominations where it is an unwritten. We, we don't worship like that. And it's not that it's wrong, but we're more contemplative. I'll give you another example. In some churches, okay, and you can you look at the architecture of the church and tell this. Okay. The pulpit is center in a Baptist church for a reason. Because the preaching of the word of God is one of the center moments of worship. Okay. We don't worship without the word of God being proclaimed. The choir was nice. Praise dancers did a good job. But if ain't no preaching, right, this, ain't, this wasn't good church. And he better be preaching. I don't know who your he is, but he better be preaching. Um, now, you can go to some churches. The lectern is on the left or the right. And what's in the center is the communion table. And if you see a lectern on the left or the right and a communion table in center, I guarantee you, whatever Sunday it is, you get in communion. Because that's what's center in the worship. Okay? And so you'll find more of the denominations that are closer to our Catholic side, like our Episcopalian brothers and sisters. They come to church to get communion. Sermon ain't got to be long, ain't even got to be powerful. A little anecdote, a homily, seven minutes to do you good. But we need communion. Whereas in our denomination, our tradition, we need the word. Okay? So it's a matter of where our focus is. And that's also based on personality. Okay? So a lot of this plays out for things that are not just worldly and it's not just confusion. Um, and then one of the final things that plays into our different denominations is the word polity. As much as you don't want to admit it, that word comes from the word polis, where we get politics, and politics play themselves out in church. It is a question of how we are governed and how we handle our business. Okay. The polity of a Baptist church is theological democracy at its best. Okay. And then there's some churches you'll go to. Let me tell you, if you're an Episcopal church, you don't get to vote on what's going to happen because that's not where you come there. You come to get communion and leave. Everything else you leave up uh, to the Episcopal, to the diocese. Okay. In the Catholic Church, there is no annual meeting because your voice doesn't count. Right? So it depends on how you want to be governed. Okay? Your polity plays out into different denominations. And so when the, the question is asked about causing confusion, I would say to you that most denominations, it's not because God is not the author of confusion, but God does recognize our personalities and our way of interpreting scripture and who we are as individuals shapes what denomination, what church we'll affiliate with. Um, and the question that was asked, and I guess we have to stop here, the question that was asked is which one is right and which one is wrong? It's the one you're being ministered to. You ought to be in a place where none of these are obstacles to you sensing your discerning of what God wants for you. And if any of them are blocked to your discernment, you need to question your membership. So if the way they're governed bothers you and you can't hear God when you come in that place, then you need to question that. If the fact that they meet too long bothers you and you can't hear nothing after 90 minutes, then you need to question whether you're there. If the fact that they got out too early only after an hour and you didn't feel that it was spirited enough, then maybe you're more on the Pentecostal side. Okay? The same way we have different tastes for food, we have different tastes for how we worship and relate to God. So what's the right denomination? The one where you hear God. The one where you feel you're growing. The one where you feel you can serve. The one where you feel you are at home. And if that, if, and there was another question that came up that I'll say this, and if where you are is not where you're growing, then there is nothing ungodly about making a change. You need to be where you're going to grow. And if Alpha Street isn't it, I pray that you find it. 
but it would be ungodly of me as a brother in Christ to expect you to stay somewhere where you're getting nothing. Okay? And it doesn't mean that we're not feeding. It may mean that we're not speaking your language any longer. Okay? And here's the reality. It's tough. You can outgrow a church. As you mature in the Lord, if, if that church is great at ministering to new believers, there may come a point when you need something deeper. You need to go where you're being fed and follow the Spirit of the Lord in that direction. All right. Well, I guess we can't really take questions from the floor because it is 8 o'clock. Uh, but thank you all. Thank you for your kindness and your patience. Um, let's get ready to close in prayer and leave this place as those who are well able to defend and explain what we believe in our hearts. You all know one of the things I like to do before we close is lift up the names of our sick and our shut-in, especially those who are in the hospital or who are preparing for surgery. So if there be a name of someone in, in that state, if you would just lift them higher now, God hears the symphony of our names. Who are we praying for tonight? You hear the names of your sons and daughters, our sisters and brothers that we lift up before you, O oh God, and ask that you would prove yourself again to be Jehovah Rapha. I heard Bishop Gilbert Patterson once say, if you can have it, God can heal it. We believe that you are able to heal in every situation, physically, mentally, and emotionally. We thank you for the healing we've received spiritually through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for our hunger for your word and a mind to understand. And I pray now that you would equip us to be witnesses of you in the world and defenders of our faith. That We don't have to win debates and arguments, but we do have to be able to explain why we believe what we believe. God, I pray that we not leave this place trying to prove who's right and who's wrong, who's best, who's better, who's good, who's not good, but rather, Lord, that we would just seek to be in the place where you've called us to be in our relationship with you. We believe that in this season of our relationship, this church family is critical for who we are and how we grow. We thank you for Alpha Street Baptist Church. We thank you for our children in Awana learning the word of God. We thank you for the volunteers that work with them. We thank you, O oh God, for our neighbor on our left and our right. It's been a good Tuesday because it ended in the house of God. Be with us now as we leave this place, but never your presence in the precious, mighty, strong name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen.